Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. VRC in the last couple of weeks have released this, the 1997 Williams FW19 for Assetto Corsa. Currently the FW19 is in version 0.1 beta specification, however as VRC have had us come to expect with their most recent releases, 0.1 beta doesn't mean an awful lot in terms of quality to be desired. This thing, as you have already seen in Several dozen? Is it safe to say several dozen? Yeah, several dozen videos that I have already released previously featuring this car. This thing is something special, to say the least. First off, the Williams FW19, is it mod worthy? Yes, 100%. This car is mod worthy by any stretch of the imagination. The Williams FW19 is the Formula One car with which Williams contested the 1997 FIA Formula One World Championship. The car was designed by the legendary Williams Brain Trust of Patrick Head and Adrian Newey. The car really can be regarded as a logical evolution of Williams Grand Prix engineering design going back to 1995 with the FW7. That car was at the time deemed a radical departure in conventional Formula One design. The FW16, the 1994 car, was from its beginning designed to be an active car. That is, a car using active suspension, an idea perfected by Williams at the end of 1991, and then of course it turned into an absolutely dominant idea through 1992 and 1993, after which time the concept was banned and then everybody was left scrambling to figure out how to make fast cars again, Williams included. The FW16, we all know that car as being infamous for the car in which the great Ayrton Senna lost his life, however the FW16 was the last Williams of that design generation. Originally designed to be an active car, then gone passive, Williams were left on the back foot at the beginning of 1994. Of course, Ayrton Senna, with those retirements at the start of the season, San Marino was supposed to be his start of the World Championship, all things considered. However, unfortunately, that never came to pass for the great Ayrton. However, Williams, by the end of 1994, was able to be fighting for victories with Damon Hill and Nigel Mansell, strangely enough, making a comeback, winning the Australian Grand Prix then at Adelaide for Williams. However, Williams got a handle on the problems that came with the transition between active and passive engineering in terms of that suspension layout and by 1995 everything started to come good. 1997 though, Williams challenging for the world championship, defending their constructors title, Damon Hill managed to win the drivers championship the previous year, however Williams still to this day one of the strangest moves in the Grand Prix drivers market let Damon Hill go at the end of 1996 despite he being the newly crowned reigning world champion. For 1997, Williams brought in Heinz Harald Frensen to replace the British legend, and Jacques Villeneuve, the Canadian, began his second year in Formula One, coming over to Grand Prix racing from IndyCar, having achieved some great success over stateside racing open wheelers there. The FW19, therefore, as I said, it's an evolution of the design trend that Williams stumbled across in 1995. In terms of the car's technical specifications, of course, we've got a carbon fiber honeycomb composite chassis here. This is the mid-90s. Carbon galore, electronics galore, not as many electronics though as we saw at the beginning of the decade. Of course, that is all down to the rules makers, but carbon fiber construction throughout as you would expect. Suspension geometry on the front end, we have an inboard torsion bar, interesting damping solution there, but double wishbone push rod as we shall see on the front end of the car. On the rear, a similar layout, however, we've got inboard coil springs there, no torsion bars, but double wishbone push rod at the rear as well. Bell cranks actuating those dampers on both the front and the rear. The engine on this thing, ooh, this engine, it is the Renault RS9 and RS9A. Back in these days, engines were developed over the course of the season in earnest. Yeah, we do have some engine development nowadays in F1, but we've got these ridiculous restrictions on what they can and what they can't develop. This was laissez-faire back in the mid-90s. So Renault, they started the season with that RSA spec, with that RS9 spec, and they eventually came into the RS9A spec and RS9B by the very end of the season. It's a V10, 3 liters, naturally aspirated. Bank angle is an interesting attribute of this engine. 71 degrees is the bank angle. So picture you're looking at the engine from front or rear on, so you just see the V. The angle of that V is at 
71 degrees at its vertex. So that's where the crankshaft is sitting in the middle and then each bank of cylinders going away from the crankshaft upward at 71 degrees. Interesting. For the last, wow, nearly 20 years in Formula One, we've been used to seeing 90 degree bank angles. So in other words, if you lay the engine on its side, the engines will form a perfect square but not in this era. 71 degree bank angle, and then later on, Renault in particular, they started to experiment with 109 and 110 degree bank angles. That is to try and get the center of gravity of the engine as low as possible so you improve the chassis dynamics, but 71 degree bank angle here. That is responsible for the unique sounds that this generation of V10 engine produced. They are real screamers. Yes, the V10s in 2004 and 2005, those things were screamers as well, but they had a very full, very, very rich, throaty sound to them. These engines, not so much. These engines are far more operatic in their timber. They have very rich harmonics, but they also have very high harmonics up in the register. If I had to apply some of my musical knowledge to the characterization of the engine sound, I would say that these engines, for the most part, are mezzo-sopranos and the 2004-2005 spec V10s, they were altos, if not very high tenors. These engines really, really sang, and VRC did a very good job on the sounds. We'll hear that a bit later on. To finish off the technical specs on the car, however, the transmission transmitting that engine's about 750 to 800 horsepower. It's a six-speed transversely mounted semi-automatic by Williams. Fuel supplied by ELF, lubricant supplied by Castrol, and tires supplied by Goodyear. 1997, the last year for the slick tires in Formula One up until 2009. Big Goodyear slicks on this FW19. Absolutely wonderful. Competition history, as I mentioned, it was driven by Jacques Villeneuve and Heinz Harald Frensen, cars number three and four respectively. The car made its debut at the 1997 Australian Grand Prix at Melbourne. Over the course of the 1997 season, the car entered 17 races, it won 8 of them, scored pole position for 10 of them, and put up fastest lap in 9 of them. That was enough for Williams to defend their Constructors' Championship, and it was enough for Jacques Villeneuve to win his first and only Drivers' Championship in that 1997 year. Really cool history on the car, really cool lineage and heritage of the car as well when you think back to 1994 and the trouble that Williams ran into at the start of the season with that regulation change, how they were able to put that right at the end of 94 and then they took what they learned and applied it in 95 and that's when this design trend really took off and Williams truly became the class of the field. Enough about the car itself however, what have VRC given us here? As you can see as this thing rotates its way around resplendently here in showroom view, 0.1 beta doesn't matter. This thing is already polished like no mod is ever polished. VRC, you guys truly have set the benchmark in terms of exterior finish on these Aceto Corsa mods. Look at this thing. It is perfect. It is 100% perfect. Did I mention it's perfect? Yeah, it's perfect. Let's get in closer here and have a look at some of the details here. Midships. Hype! Yes, I sound pretty hyped so far in this review because it's hype-worthy. And the car even has hype printed on it. Of course, that's a sponsor of the era, but it's hype-worthy, 100%. Just have a look at all of this on here. Look at those reflections across the top of the side pods there where the shadow's falling across the car. That's brilliant stuff. Absolutely brilliant stuff. The the way the light hits this thing, the reflections, the, the light reflections and the optical reflection quality, perfect. Absolutely great stuff. We'll look rearward here and you'll see the beginnings of some of those flow modifiers on Formula One cars that then became ubiquitous certainly by 2002 and definitely by 2008. You saw those big flares that came up over the rear wheels to try and clean up that airflow and take care of that turbulence problem because I mean these wheels sitting out there in the airstream, yeah they create a lot of turbulence and drag. You can just see the prototypical beginnings of those flick ups right there on the trailing edge of the side pod. Wonderful coming to the rear section itself. Let's stop the rotation for a moment and just admire this tire. Do you see that sidewall? I see that sidewall. That's a really cool looking sidewall. Great detail there. You can see all of the embossed uh, detailing there. You can see D4034 serial number there. Obviously you have the painted decals, Goodyear, Eagle, and then an embossed 
F1 decal, absolutely wonderful stuff. You can look closer on the wheel and tire there. You can see Made in USA, of course, Goodyear, an American company. Absolutely great detail on that tire. And upside down there at the bottom of the wheel, you can see radial, also embossed there. Wonderful stuff. Great wheel detail as well. We get a better look at the front wheels a little bit later on, so we'll have a look at that. But we'll start up the rotation again and just watch the rear end come into focus. You can look inboard there and see the gearbox casing and one of the exhausts coming out of that V10. Oh, we've got some detail coming our way. See the rear wing end plate there, bolt holes, and you can see the bolts themselves holding the flap elements in their given positions for different downforce trims. Oh yeah, and now for our eyes enjoyment, the diffuser. I'm not quite sure how to characterize the diffuser on this car. Is it simple? Is it complex? It's certainly of the era. I would call this, yeah, I'd call it a triple-decker diffuser. And I'm rationalizing that by looking at the outboard sides, the floor of the car, if you will, the reference plane area for those of you more technically inclined. And then we get the intersection, the outermost intersection. So that's level one where you see some of the strakes there as it steps up at 90 degrees. And then you have the central section of this diffuser where it steps up again at 90 degrees and forms this central tunnel. This is the diffuser design that Formula One teams used in this era and then all the way up into 2008. So yes, in terms of a design benchmark, Williams were that design benchmark starting in 1995 and then it really came good in 97 on this car. Every Formula One car after this had more in common with this design than you might think. There's a reason why cars like these from the mid-90s don't look particularly dated. That's because the overall design trend from 1995 or so all the way up to 2008 and now again in 2017, they stumbled across a combination that really worked and for that reason, there's no reason to change very much. So the cars today still bear quite a lot of resemblance to cars from 20 years ago. When things work, don't fix them. Looking in closer here on the detail, you can see wonderful carbon weave detail here on the rear crash structure, much smaller than the rear crash structure is today. However, you can see that weave of the carbon composite material on the lower beam wings, as well as on that rear crash structure, as well as on the diffuser itself. Brilliant stuff. Looking inside that inboard section underneath the rear bodywork, there is that Renault RS9 engine in all of its glory, and those exhausts coming out the bottom of the car. This is something that we haven't seen in a very long time. Last time we saw this was on, again, Adrian Newey's designs, the Red Bulls. The RB5 starting in 2009 and then all the way up to the RB9 in 2013. That lower exhaust blowing diffusers, but on this car blowing the beam wing, that lower element of the rear wing. You can see how those exhausts are angled up. That's not to get the pipes out of the way of the diffuser. That is to angle that energized high pressure exhaust flow and shoot it toward that beam wing to create some downforce there. Very cool design and that's not something new for this era either, but it really did help the rear end grip on this car because it is a little bit twitchy as we will see a little bit later on. You can see in the center here, VRC really good at this stuff. The rain light and the pit lane light. You can hit the 7 key on the numpad and then it comes to life. You can see every individual bulb element LEDs in this era comes to life. Brilliant detail. There's also a very nice light bloom effect there. Wonderful stuff. We'll turn it off now. You can take off your sunglasses. Looking here on the other side of the car, you can see more of that engine detail. You can also see the half shafts or the prop shafts coming out from the back of the gearbox and the differential. Very cool. Very, very cool indeed. Coming up now to the shadowed side of the car, you can see those optical reflections in very high quality now. All I can say is great detail, VRC. You've done it yet again. You've done it yet again. Yes, you have. You can see here the fuel filler on the right-hand side of the car. Notice that there's no flap over that filler. That was a rule that was put in place, I believe, after 1997, because if I recall correctly, there was an incident in Argentina where Pedro Diniz, he had a spin, and I think it was because there was a fuel leak um, coming out of that nozzle, and the, the fuel got over his rear tires, which of course broke their traction, and he spun. But after that, the, the car burst into flames, and you could see flames literally belching out the sides of the car, but the, they, they were attached to liquid. You could see, there's video of it someplace, I'm sure. Uh, 
go in the search bar and search Pedro Diniz's uh, Argentina 1997, I believe it was 1997, and you just see fuel pouring out the sides of the car. It's a flame and it's ugly. Diniz was okay, thankfully, in that incident, but after that, the FIA said, you've got to put some sort of a door over that fuel filler, so in case it does jam open, there's at least some containment of that. So you'll notice the open fuel filler here. That was a feature that was subsequently deleted from Formula One cars. It also led to the era of having those fuel doors stick in the open position. If there was some sort of failure in that mechanism, the teams designed it so it would fail open, so at least they'd be able to refuel the car. Aerodynamics got spoiled when that happened, and quite often you would see either the fuel doors themselves or some adjacent winglets break off due to the turbulence created by that fuel door being stuck in the open position. However, enough about obscure details like that. Here midships, you can see the barge boards, single element barge boards in this era. You can see that hype lettering. It's yellow on the right side, it's red on the left side, but you can see it's just a single barge board. There's a single main plane here. There are no boards below the front suspension as we see on later cars, particularly the F2004 and more recently the Renault R25 that I've reviewed recently, you don't see any of that barge board treatment here. Just a single vein midships in a conventional location. You can see the stays there securing that barge board. Very cool. And also, one of those barge boards was damaged at the 1997 European Grand Prix at Jerez de la Frontera because Michael Schumacher tried to win the championship. Yes, we'll leave it at that. Midships here on the car top side, you can see a web address. Yeah, it's the 90s. The internet is becoming a thing, and you can see that web address there. I am sure that is no longer active, and it probably hasn't been active since 1997. But yeah, a URL on a Formula One car. Is it the first URL on a Formula One car? I'm not sure, but it may well be. Somebody in the comments, please answer that question, because I'm sure somebody out there knows that little tidbit of information. Looking across the front end here, you can see that front suspension now, double wishbone push rod, as we mentioned. And also, down below, we'll stop the rotation again, you can see very nicely, you can see that tea tray or tongue area of the car. This is basically the front of the floor, and it really is the first element of the diffuser, if you want to call it that. This design is there so that the air starts to split as it passes underneath the car. It feeds the radiator inlets there, and if you look toward the side pod on the right-hand side, you can see that radiator inside there, inside that duct. But that's the tea tray or the tongue. Some people call it a tea tray as in a tea dash tray. Some people call it a tea tray as in a T-E-A, like the drink tray, or some people call it a tongue. I think it looks like a tongue. I call it a tongue, but there it is. Very cool detail there, and you can see some bolts there for securing that legality plank. The wooden plank in these days, nowadays it's a composite that's based on wood, but yep, the plank on the bottom of the car for legality reasons. Michael Schumacher, Belgium, we won't talk about it. However, here, front wing, yeah, that's the front wing on a 97 Formula One car. Two elements, no flick-ups, no flow modifiers, no flying buttress bridge sections, that's it. It's effectively a single main plane wing, that, that lower element there, it's effectively a neutral section, and then all your downforce generated by that upper flap. But you can see, very simple wing secured to the front end by these very long pylons. Again, that's to funnel air underneath the car, so you want to mount the wing as low as possible and have a bunch of area on the nose open to have air start to funnel under the car. They're not using ground effect per se because the under underside of this car is not sealed. These cars are not running skirts or anything like that, unlike the Lotus 79 that we've also looked at, but again, underbody downforce, very important. Get as much air under the car as possible. Over here on the left side of the car, you can see this geometry inboard of the barge boards between the monocoque itself and that barge board. You can see the suspension element passing through the barge board there. Very, very nicely detailed, guys. Also, let's look at the obvious. How close can we get? This is as close as we can get to this car here in showroom view. And the textures here, the colors, the reflections, no breakup whatsoever. I see zero pixelation. Wonderfully done absolutely wonderfully done guys I cannot laud you enough looking across here on the other side of the car front end now here's that wheel detail you can see here a little bit more detail on those tires first of all for racing purposes only not for highway use yeah that lettering is there also looking at the wheel the OZ racing wheels nicely powder coated in dark gray and on the inside you can see AP racing calipers 
You can see those carbon ceramic discs, and you can see one of those tattletale temperature, peak temperature stickers on the caliper, just so you can see what the peak temperatures were on the brake system. Also, really cool detail on the wheel nut and that safety pin there locking in the center. Very, very cool. Midships now, top side, cockpit. Yeah, have a look at that cockpit. Really nicely detailed here. A little bit more detail in the cockpit than we have on VRC's Renault R25 for the moment, but let's go in. First off, eye point in here is a little high. We will be driving this car from considerably lower, and uh, you, you'll see that creates a little bit of a problem once we get the car out on track. But for the moment, this is our vantage point. Everything switched off. You can see that cockpit detail. Very nice. Unlike the R25 for the moment, we do have seat belts in this car, and that is a welcome sight indeed. Certainly don't want to be flying around at 190 miles an hour with no seat belts. But yeah, nice details in here, generally speaking. You can see a lot of padding on the sides of the cockpit here because it's a tight fit, and yeah, you do want some creature comfort, so there's some padding in here. Missing for the moment are the decals that Williams would put in the car, the stars, the white, gold, and red stars that Williams would put in the cockpit over the course of the season. The stars of different colors, I can't quite recall which is which, but they would put colored star stickers in the cockpit for race wins and championship wins, so that's a detail that is missing for the moment. But for the most part, everything is here. You can see the emergency marshal clutch, the big red N there in the circle, that's there. The marshals could reach into the cockpit and pop a stranded car into neutral. Also, you can see the Williams chassis plate there, Williams Grand Prix Engineering on the left side of the bulkhead. On the right side of the bulkhead, the main ignition kill, that is either for the drivers or for the teams or for the marshals to use should they encounter a car with a runaway engine and they need to kill the thing. Steering wheel. It's the mid-90s, but this is still a reasonably simple steering wheel. It's no longer circular. So yeah, we do have some evolution in that regard. The top of it has been cut off and flattened out so the driver can see where he's going. That's a pretty important thing. But we've got four buttons on it and then two paddles for upshift and downshift. Still a foot-operated clutch in this era, so there are three pedals in the footwell. And then upshift and downshift, right and left respectively, that's it. You've got a button for neutral, you've got an ignition cut, and then you have a radio button and then some other button that I can't quite figure the function for. I'm sure it was some proprietary Williams solution or maybe it was a dash page. I'm not entirely sure, but reasonably simple and it certainly looks of the era. Really cool. The mid-90s, it, it's a cool time. It's, uh, it's the earliest that I can personally go back and recall reasonably vivid, reasonably complete adult-type memories from. So this car really brings me back to my childhood, too. No, I was not a Formula One fan at that time, but I do very strongly identify with the design and the technology of that era. I still have, for example, computers from the mid-90s, so this stuff is not at all foreign to me, but it does fill me with a bit of nostalgia. Really nicely done, indeed. Speaking of 90s computer technology, we have a digital display. It's that grayish window you can see that's currently in its off state at the moment in showroom view, but we will have information there about fuel level, gear, and speed, and that's it. Across the top there, you can see the forward roll structure. This will come into play later on when we're out on track because it's very difficult to see out of this car, but you can see red light on there. That is the shift light, and that's the only bit of instrumentation you have in this car that tells you when to change gear. That single red light will come on when you're approaching the rev limiter. Pop the pedal on the right, and then you're in the next gear. Looking around the sides of the cockpit, decent texture work here. You can see the weave in the seat belts, really, really cool. And then the headrest here on the back side of the cockpit, and then the air snorkel with carbon fiber detail inside. Nicely done. And then the very top, this is that mid 90s camera mount, a vertical camera mount. They did not use those T bars that they uh, continue to use today. It was a vertical solution. Again, the cameras in this era were a bit larger. As technology evolved, things got smaller and lighter, but to fit the cameras of the era, they had that vertical camera mount. I think it looks all right. Some people think it spoils the lines of the car. Maybe it does to some extent, but I think it looks all right, and it's definitely appropriate for the era. Looking around the other side of the cockpit, little flow modifiers there, just the rears of the driver's head, just to probably clean up some turbulence that the helmet creates. And then looking across the other side, you can see the mirrors. You can't really see these mirrors when you're driving the car. Again, it depends on where your field of view is set, but 
they're where they should be and they would give you a decent view of what's going on behind could you see them where we're driving from you can't really see the mirror sometimes in the corners you can sneak a peek but for the most part they are invisible to our eyes from the driving position however that about cleans up what we have in the cockpit so we believe said cockpit and just take one last look at this wonderful FW19 from VRC today we're gonna take this car to Vallelunga. I have not done a review at Vallelunga yet and it's a decent all-round circuit. We've got some low speed corners, we've got some high speed corners, we've got some long straights. So let's go to Vallelunga and show you what the thing can do. It is also an appropriate venue for this car, not because it has any racing significance in terms of history in Formula One, but there's a lot of runoff area at Vallelunga and uh, we might need it <laughs> because as I mentioned before, this thing is ever so slightly twitchy. Yeah. That's the biggest euphemism I've said yet. It's very twitchy, and you really do have to pay attention to your driving style to get the most out of this car. You know that I like to stab at the throttle a lot? Well, I've got to calm down quite considerably to get the most out of this car. We'll talk about that more in mere moments. Welcome to Vallelunga. Before we get out on track, of course, we're going to have a look through the setup screens and show you what's going on with VRC's FW19. Here on the gear screen, of course, you've got your gearbox. First through sixth gear, plus your final drive ratio. You can adjust these any way you like. Default values are shown. Tires, choice of compounds. You've got hards, mediums, and softs. Defaults to the soft compound, 12 PSI all around. Fuel, we've shut the engine down here, zero liters, but the maximum fuel capacity is 124 liters, as you can see. Refueling was allowed in Formula One in this era, so do plan your pit stop strategy accordingly. Aero screen front and rear wings, your only adjustments you can make here. You do not see the flaps change their angle visually, however the effects are modeled, default values are shown. Alignment, camber and toe on all four corners, of course all default values here, you can adjust these any way you like dampers, your bound and rebound on your damper settings on all four corners. Infinitely adjustable, of course. Drivetrain, diff power, coast, and preload. I like the car to be a little bit more pointy, and I also like the car to be a little bit more progressive on the throttle, so I can stab at it. However, we will talk about that later on, so default values here. I would tend to add a little bit more power and coast. Generic engine limiter defaults to 100, goes down to 84. If you really want to go down that far, I don't recall any other car having an engine limiter able to be set so low. That is the rev limiter, of course. Uh, don't know why you would set it down so low, but there it is if you want to. Brake bias and brake power default values there, as well as your steering assist, that is your power steering. Suspensions, any roll bars front and rear, as well as your wheel rates and ride heights on all four corners. Secondary suspension screen, your travel range on the heave damper on the front, so your front third spring. And then your travel ranges on all four corners of your conventional suspension. So all of your default values are shown in that area, as you can see. Our first run here is going to be on this default setup. The default fuel level is 50 liters, so we are going to run 50 liters of fuel for this first run, as well as on those soft Goodyear tires. So, here we are in the pit lane. The car is now alive. The first thing that we're going to do before we even go in the cockpit, listen to the sounds. First of all, from this angle, with the engine in front of us, the exhausts are facing away from us. You got that? Now let's go back here and hear this thing. Yeah. That's what we're talking about here. Some people have been critical of the sounds on this car, particularly because it's a little bit too quiet when you're off the throttle. And yeah, I tend to agree with that. That is something that needs to be fixed. Remember, this is 0.1 beta, so as good as it is, little teething problems are to be expected. That is certainly one of them. However, once we go into the cockpit, you will notice a difference. Yeah, sound-wise, things are a bit different, but have a look. Everything is now alive. You can see that display in the center of the dashboard. The N for neutral, zero, because we are not doing any speed at the moment, and then our 50 liters of fuel down there, center in the bottom. So, row up and down through the box. Goes up to six, goes down to R, and then, of course, N for neutral. 50 liters of fuel on board. 
You can see around the cockpit, nice steering animations there. The arms and hands move around nicely. Steering rotates nicely. You can see the uh, front wheels there changing their angle. Of course, with the steering, that's all copacetic. However, enough banter. Let's go. Just a shakedown run here on default setup. Hop into sixth gear now, get everything warmed up, start building some tire and brake temperature. See that gearbox on the downshift is very quick. Little bit of transmission noise, very nice. 150 miles an hour and we're still not even really in the power band of this V10 engine. Being very cautious here, trying to build some temperature. Also, it's time to address the elephant in the room. Look directly straight ahead. What do you see? You see the front roll structure, and you don't see anything else. Yeah, this car is a bit of an adjustment from a visual standpoint from what you can see in the cockpit. It's bad in terms of frontal visibility. However, I have no reason to believe that that is in any way inaccurate. It seems to me, judging from the position of the driver's eyes as he's sitting in the seat, that is about the view that he would have going around in this thing. Now, you've got to understand something about the human brain and the human eye. When the eye is focused on moving targets as we give the engines of revs now going down the straight for the first time with some temperature behind us. When the human eye is looking at things at a distance, it tends to tune out everything in the foreground. And when you're driving a race car, or any car for that matter, your focus really... Ah, uh, there's that engine. Your focus should not be on what is directly in front of you anyway. So, putting that big roll structure in the middle there right in what you would think is your field of view really doesn't matter all that much. Now, of course, this is not as easy to replicate in the sim world because we have infinite depth of field. Everything is at the same focal length, so everything far away as well as everything close up is in perfect focus. So it is not how your eye works in reality. Having driven an open wheel, open cockpit formula car, I can tell you that what you see directly in front of you doesn't really matter. Your eyes are several hundred meters down the racetrack at any one time. You're thinking about where you want the car to end up. You're not thinking so much about where the car currently is because you've already computed that for yourself a few seconds ago. However, enough about physics and optics. Listen to this power. 800 horsepower. From that 3-liter V10 behind us, the Renault RS9 onto the brakes into turn one and, oh my goodness. What have we got going on here as we rip the under tray off the car over the curves? Well, we've got the Williams Renault FW19 and, oh my. What is this thing? What is it? What is it on default setup? Well, it's fast. It's really fast as you can see. I have a lot of seat time in this car, so I've just sort of surreptitiously put the power down while I was talking about something else, because I feel very confident in it, but I have a lot of practice already. So that's not quite representative of what you're going to get in your first shakedown run of this car. What you're going to get when you sit in this thing for the first time and you put it out on track is you're going to get a lot of wheel spin like that. You're going to get a lot of understeer at slow speeds, and build up a little bit of momentum here, you're going to get a lot of twitch under braking. That's going to be the first thing you notice about this car, initially. It's not a deficit of rear downforce, don't think about that. It's just the attitude of this thing, and you've got to get your head around it. We'll talk about that a little bit more as the run unfolds. However, as you can see, screaming down the straight 190 miles an hour, you can get on the brakes pretty late, and then you've got to catch the back end when it steps out invariably. 
It is a 1997 Formula One car, of course, so the brakes are really good. You can lean on them. The engine is equally good, if not even slightly better than the brakes. It's just got power. But you do have to be very metered in terms of how you bring that power on. So, enough with the theatrics. How does this thing actually feel? Well, under power, you're going to get wheel spin in first and second gear. So there's that. On the brakes, it's nervous. It's nervous on the rear end. I haven't touched the setup. This is default. You can see we lock the front sometimes and the rear skates. This is a weight transfer problem and you do have to be mindful of it. You can play with the ride heights to adjust that. Sometimes mid-corner you will get understeer like this. Other times mid-corner you will get oversteer like that when you get on the power too quickly. I mentioned in showroom view that this car really requires you to address your driving style and be very cognizant of your control inputs. Your throttle application in this car has to be very progressive. You have to be almost like a robot on the throttle with this thing. I was going to describe it as a digital type input, but digital is zero or one, so that would be on or off, and that does not apply here. You have to be robotic. You have to be so precise all the time and so progressive with that power input that you can't stab at it like like that, for example. It just unsettles the car. You've got to be Schumacher, basically. You've got to be so suave and so supple with that input. And as the power comes on, you just blend more and more throttle in. You don't get up to like 50 or 60 or 70 or 80% power and then stomp on it because that's going to unsettle the rear. You've got to be progressive, just like that. Coming out of this corner is a good opportunity to demonstrate that. Progressive, there you go. Default setup, high speeds, no problem at all. No understeer, no oversteer. It just feels very, very solid. Under brakes, weight shifts to the front. Rear axle gets a little bit light. On the power through your medium speed corners, progressive, like I mentioned. Coming down the straights through fourth, fifth, and now just about to pop sixth gear. Great power delivery. The engine has a very, very good torque curve. And as you can see, I picked Valalunga for the runoff. We need the runoff. If you leave your braking too late and then you start your downshifts, you are going to unsettle the car and you're going to spin it really, really fast just like that. No prayer of catching it. So not only are your inputs very important in this car, but your landmarks in terms of when you pick your braking points, you have to be precise. You can't be asking yourself any questions when you're driving this thing. You can't be very unfamiliar with the circuit. You have to know where the corners are. You have to know when to brake. You have to know when to put the power back on. This is not a car for the novice by any stretch of the imagination. If you are new to Assetto Corsa and you're still trying to get your head around the physics model and things like that, don't get this. Don't get this yet. You'll be discouraged too quickly. You've got to know what you're doing to get the most out of this car. the infield straight now. 175 miles an hour, 180, sixth gear, brakes here at Vallelunga. Because there are so many different circuit configurations here, some of the curbs don't quite match up with the corners that you're going into, simply because they serve as shortcuts for different circuit configurations. And uh, because of that, and also because there's not much elevation change at this circuit, finding landmarks here, in terms of sighting yourself around, can be a little bit tricky. So. Yeah, experience, you need that around this place. And as I mentioned in this car, you need experience. That little chicane there at the end of the lap, you're in that transitional zone between aero grip and mechanical grip. The car understeers like crazy. Tires are not biting the circuit yet because they are depending on that download from the downforce to really sink in and 
bite the track. So understeer at low and medium speeds as you would expect from a wing car like this, from a passive wing car like this. However, once that downforce builds over 100 miles an hour or so, that's when you can really start to lean on it. And then it behaves like any other Formula One car from the last 25 years or so. Snatching the rear axle under braking there. You can see how nervous the car becomes. Some of that is down to the car's general behavior. Some of that is down to this default setup. Which we are going to get rid of presently. So back into the pits with us. And let us load the setup that I have been playing around with, with this car. I've done a video of this car already here at Valladolid. The biggest changes that I have made really is the gearbox. I've made fifth gear a bit shorter, just so we get to the power band a bit sooner, and then sixth gear has been shortened a bit as well, because we're not going to break 190 miles an hour or so down that straight, so we don't really need it geared any longer than that for the most part. I've left some room at the top end of sixth gear for drafting in race situations. Otherwise, I've lowered the tire pressures to 10 PSI all around, still on those softs. And the fuel level, well, of course, that's always variable. We're going to put a bit more gas in it. Front and rear wings, I haven't touched them. I could probably afford to drop a bit of wing, but I'm happy with where it is for the moment for this run. I haven't really touched the suspension very much. I don't think I've touched it at all, to be honest. Drivetrain, here's where we make some adjustments. I want a little bit more time before it locks. So, power and coast. Engine limiter, haven't touched it. Brake bias, you want to ramp that forward ever so slightly because that rear axle does lock under heavy braking, so 59 to the front is typically okay. Brake power's fine at 100. Ride heights, I've dropped the front ride height significantly because I like rake in a car, make it a little bit more pointy, get rid of some of that medium speed understeer and the secondary suspension screen. Car feels very stable and heave. Travel ranges of all the suspension components are good. It's not bottoming the suspension anywhere, so that is fine. Now, back out on the circuit for the review proper. Yeah. Light up those rears into the pit lane. And back out onto the racetrack. Full speed now. Who cares about a warm-up? Now, pull sixth gear a little bit sooner, as you would expect. Again, I did shorten fifth ever so slightly. As we work that final warm-up into the tires, just have a look around the cockpit. Yeah, we mentioned that forward visibility is not great in this car due to that forward roll structure, but everything else in here is just as it should. We are sitting far lower and a little bit more forward than we were in showroom view, and that is totally accurate as far as I'm concerned. Looking at the position of the driver's head in the real car, looking at actual pictures, this seems to be about what Jacques Villeneuve and Heinz Howard Frensen would have been seeing. So that makes sense. You can't see the rear view mirrors at all, occasionally through a corner, sometimes depending on how the bumps carry you through, but for the most part, no. However, this thing is so fast <laughs> that you're not so much concerned about what's behind you. You're concerned about looking as far down the road as you possibly can to make sure that you're not going to be headed towards some hedge or some barrier at a very high rate of speed. Third gear into turn one, clip the curbs, feed the power in. Fourth gear a little bit early, now into fifth. Down the infield straight, waiting for sixth, there it is. And brakes. Just as soon as that left side curbing comes into view, you slam the brakes, because if you wait until you're right alongside the curbing, it's too late. Same with this corner, as soon as that right side curbing comes into view, get on the brakes. 
sheet across the road a little bit there. You can take a wide approach through this corner and then bring it in for a late apex because you need that exit launch before you get into the slowest corner on the circuit, this hairpin. And the final chicane. Again, that transitional zone between aero and mechanical grip. And back around this slightly banked final corner at Valadunga. Now we've got some heat in the tires. I feel comfortable. Get down to business with my setup changes. Because I did one too many downshifts there. That's what happens. You unsettle the rear axle. You've got to be precise. You've got to be really precise. That means if you have to take a corner in third gear, you have to take that corner in third gear. There's no third or second in this car. This is a second gear corner. You don't take it in third, you'll understeer wide. The hairpin coming up. This one is a first gear corner. You don't take it in second because you'll understeer wide. You get on the power very judiciously. It's deliberate. Every act in this car is a deliberate, intentional act. There's no zoning out in this thing. You have to be very, very turned on to drive this thing well and to drive this thing quickly. If you're having a little bit of an off day, this thing will frustrate you to no end. You've got to be absolutely with it at all times because it's always looking to kill you at every possible moment. It's an easy car to drive when you drive within its limits. It really is. And I understand how in 1996, with basically the same car, Damon Hill was so successful. I understand how in 1997, Jacques Villeneuve was so successful, because once you understand it, once you get your head around it, it makes perfect sense. It's very predictable. It's very compliant. It's almost complacent with you. But as you are starting to get your head around it, there will be surprises around literally every corner. Second gear. There it is. No problem. Pick up a little bit of apex curb and then feed the power in. Use all the exit curb. On the brakes, first gear, throw it in. There it is, a little wide of the apex. On the power, very judiciously, that wheel spin in second gear, just be ready for it. A little twitchy through third there, through the left-hander. Go wide, pick up the apex curbs late, right where that sausage curb is, now on the power. Everything that you do in here is intentional. Every motion has to be orchestrated from above, meaning your brain is tuned in 100% of the time. As far as where my eyes are going, dealing with that big roll hoop in the center, my eyes are very far down the racetrack at all times. I am not looking directly in front of me. I'm looking for my apex curbs here through the left. Now I'm looking for the exit curbs. I see them, there they are. Now I'm looking for the gantry that's overhead. There it is, there's the light gantry. Curbs on the left, curbs on the right. Look for that apex, hit that apex. There it is, on the power, exit curbs, there they are. Over a slight crest, looking for the next corner, looking for the right for those curbs, there they are. Looking for the left for those curbs, there they are. Looking for the right for those curbs. I am not looking straight ahead on this car at all. I'm looking off to the side and I'm looking out in the distance quite significantly. And there's the power on a little bit too quickly and there's the nose taken off. Well, that's what happens when you're not paying attention. I'm trying to talk about what I'm looking at rather than thinking about what I have to do next. That's what I mean. You have to be queued up with this car. Put a little bit more gas in it. Put new tires on to repair all our damage. Not too much anyway. That's what you call a very low speed leisurely shunt. Finishing up the fueling. And off we go.
However, once you settle back down, once you just start to get your head in the game and you say, all right, enough thinking about what it looks like or thinking about what I'm doing and just start thinking about driving. Think only about what is required to drive the car. And if you're in a race situation, don't think so much about your strategy. You've got to do all that thinking ahead of time. When you're in the race, you're going to be thinking about who's behind me, who's in front of me, and where am I in relation to them. And that's it. Everything else, you have to be very deliberate, as I've mentioned. As far as from a visual standpoint, aside from the visibility restrictions that you've got in this thing, everything else sort of melts, like I mentioned. You're looking so far down the track that you don't get the opportunity, unfortunately, to appreciate the level of detail in this cockpit. I mean, you can see the little latches there holding the cockpit surround to the sides of the monocoque. It's great, the two red arrows punctuating that showing the marshals where those clamps are so it could be removed if the driver needs to get out with some assistance. You've got that display in the center. It's just a monochrome LCD that's so very 90s. It doesn't tell you all that much information, but it tells you enough, it tells you all the essentials and nothing more, nothing to distract you from the job that is driving this car. That shift light right up there on that frontal roll structure, that's the only other bit of instrumentation you have. And it just lets you know when you're approaching that rev limiter. When it comes on, change gear. I mentioned that you're not looking straight ahead. That's okay, because that light is bright enough to where you will see it no matter where your eyes are. Also, just visually from the cockpit, I like the transparency effect on that little windscreen fairing that's in front of us here on the front edge of the cockpit. That looks very nice. There's no distortion from a visual standpoint of anything coming through that screen. Everything just looks as it should. Very nice touch. I also like that you can see the two little ears across the top of the car. You have the center roll structure, and then to either side there on the front of the monocoque, you have those little winglets, those ears that are off the top. Those are probably fairings for the suspension bell cranks, but they also aid you in sighting the car. So if you can overlap that, with an area on track where you want your front wheel to be, more or less, it's a pretty reliable and accurate sighting device. Other visual details you've got, you can see those brake discs glowing when you get on the brakes hard. Have a look through here. There they are, glowing bright red. Such a nice touch. I always love it when you can see the front brakes from the cockpit. I don't know why it doesn't do anything in terms of helping you drive the car, but I just think it's such a, a cool element of immersion to be able to see something like that. You see immediately the consequences of your actions on the car itself, not just on where you are on the circuit. The other thing in terms of immersion, those sounds, these cockpit sounds are absolutely phenomenal. Lots of revs on the motor. Of course, you're going to hear them better when we've got hot laps at the end of the video, but these sounds are something to behold. And you can hear what I mean by my mezzo-soprano characterization of these mid-90s V10s. They just sing up the scale all the way. And the harmonics are such, particularly on the external sounds, they're just... There's so much depth to this sound. There are very few other mods that have a sound as dynamic as this one. Yes, they're a little quiet when you're off throttle, particularly on the external sounds, but who cares? Who cares at this point? The driving experience here is something different. just got such an airy quality to that sound. 
you can almost hear the air going through the intake plenum on that engine behind us. It's it's so visceral, yet it's so refined. It's not like the the RSS Formula 79 where it's just a little brutish. It, this feels very, very refined. This is the upper echelon of technology here. It's really quite exquisite. In terms of your, your utilitarian things, force feedback feels real good. My Thrustmaster TSPC feels really nice. Steering weight is okay. It's not very light. It's not light at all like, uh, like the R25, for example. That car feels a bit too light. This is very nice. The, the steering is just heavy enough, but it's not overburdensome by any stretch of the imagination. Force feedback, very high quality, very high definition. You feel all the bumps in the road. You feel the curbing. You feel if you go off. You certainly feel if you hit the wall, but it's just... It's just as you would expect. It's not overpowering, but you have a very good sense of where the car is, particularly the front axle, but also the rear. You can get a very good sense of where the rear is, and again, I'm not 100% concentrating, and I'm missing my marks by fractions, and it's enough to put me off. Sensing a trend, whenever I go into a long soliloquy, I spin. Maybe that's the most telling thing about this car. It really does require concentration. I sense the title of a video. pipe down for a lap and just hit all the marks and be accurate. The marks don't hit him too hard. Very nice. On the brakes, 5, 4, 3. A little wide, a little wide. That's okay. Feed the power in. On the power. 4, 5. Exit curves. Nice. 6, 180. Four brakes. A little wide, we can recover, no problem. Progressive. Four, five brakes. One. Lock up on the right front. It's okay. See, when you concentrate, it's easy. <laughs> it's really easy when you concentrate. But when your attention is divided, it's not. It's not easy at all. You've really got to adapt your brain and your driving style to get the most out of this car. Here's the fuel light coming on at 15 liters. I'll blip the throttle through here and watch what happens. See, I can't get the car to turn in. That's the technique that I would use in a turbo car, for example. Lots of blipping to build boost. There, you get into the power band too soon, and you light up the rears. More throttle blipping. Throttle blipping through here, watch what happens. Understeer City. 
Progressive. Progressive is what you've got to do. Progressive. Yep. Little vibration on the front end now. Slightly flat spotted that right front tire. Not a big deal. the brake slightly late get away with it And as you can see, sometimes it still surprises you. The most surprising thing of all about this car, though, really was how challenging it was to, to do the initial shakedown. I mean, I was shocked at the learning curve that this thing has. I've, I've done so much running in cars like this, but this felt like the first time. It really did. It, it, this doesn't feel like the, the Ferrari F310, for, for instance, from 1996. That car is much more pliable. You can, you can make it do what you want. This one, this car, makes you do what it wants. This car drives you, you don't drive it. You're not the master of this beast. It's, it's the other way around with this. You can tell that this is an Atria Nui design because it is so nervous outside of its performance envelope. It's designed to do one thing in one way. If you try to drive it like Senna, if you try to use that throttle blipping technique that I just instinctively like as well, it's not gonna do it. The car likes linearity. It, you can tell it was designed by a very linear thinking guy, a very mathematical guy like Adrian Newey. There's not a lot of passion in here. Yes, the engine sound is great. Yes, that engine power does take you aback, even if you are familiar with some more modern F1 cars, particularly the V10s, and now in 2017 with the turbo hybrids, they've got more power, but I don't want to call it soulless because it's not soulless. This is a very impassioned experience because it's it, it's technical. It's not passionate. It's technical. If you like the technical side of sim racing, if you like the technical side of trying to drive a Formula One car fast, you'll love this. It's, it's all about the very fine details. If you overlook the fine details, this car is going to be over your head by miles. If you are willing to take the time and learn about how the setup works and learn about your driving style and figure out if you're doing anything that's upsetting the car just from your inputs, then you're going to have a blast in this. But if you're somebody who gets in a Ferrari and just listens to the engine and says, wow, this is fantastic, this is not the car for you. Because, yes, you will have those, wow, this is fantastic moments, but you're not going to have them straight from the beginning. It requires a little bit of work to get there. We'll just throw some new shoes on the car for the sake of it. However, That is the conclusion of the run for us here in VRC's 1997 Williams FW19. It is the car it says it is. This is the mid-90s Formula One World Championship archetype. This is it. It won Jacques Villeneuve the world title in 1997. Its older sibling won Damon Hill the world title in 1996. It became the standard of Formula One car design, and you really start to understand why, because 
it is so focused and it requires the driver to be so focused if you are a little bit free with your inputs if you're not extremely precise if you don't choose exactly the right moment to get on the power if you don't choose exactly the right moment to get on the brakes you're off and there's no recovery the car has zero tolerance for error you have to know what it can do and what it can't do and if you don't operate within that envelope you're done and you're not going to be able to find any speed whatsoever in here this requires a lot of testing it requires a lot of thinking but more importantly it requires a lot of commitment if you like this car and you want to reap its rewards, you have to invest the seat time. It's really the first mod that I think I've reviewed recently where it's it's rather inaccessible to a novice. This one is something that you need to have experience driving these kinds of cars, and I mean appreciable experience driving these kinds of cars, before you can really start to get down to the raw pace of it. If you drive GTs or other tin tops most of the time, you're going to be completely out of your element in this, hands down. If you are an open-wheeler guy, yeah, you're going to understand this very quickly, but it still is going to take some time to get your head around because it is just so different. The engine power is phenomenal, but it's also something you're used to. The grip is phenomenal, but it's also something you're used to. It's just the particular combination of those two variables coming together on this car that's a little bit different. The rear end feels skatey under braking, which you kind of expect because the downforce drops off when you slow down, but at the same time, when you get back on the power, the, the ultimate grip isn't there anymore because the downforce isn't there. So you've got to be progressive, and you can't lean on the rear tires as much because well, they're 97 tires, and yeah, they're slicks. They're they're Formula One racing slicks. They're very good tires, but they're they're 20 years old at this point. So even with the modern slicks, particularly in 2017, they have tons of grip all the time. You can lay on the throttle in Formula Hybrid, for instance, in third gear, and you won't get wheel spin. But not the case in this. So also remember, this car is 100 kilograms lighter than a 2017 car. So even though we're talking reasonably similar power figures here. We, we've got 100 kilograms less weight behind us, so that's less, yeah, that's going to enable you to accelerate faster, but that's also less force pushing those tires into the track. So your overall deficit of grip, it's 20-year-old downforce, it's 20-year-old tires, and it's also 100 kilos less weight than maybe you're used to from the very latest generation of cars. But all of that being said... Those are not detractors from this by any means. I think this car behaves exactly as it should, given what we saw in 1997. And I've looked over lots of onboard footage of this car in preparation for, for this one, and also just trying to get my, my head around how to drive this car for myself. And I've got to tell you, this does what you see on the onboards. And it's really, really cool to experience, because... It just shows you the fidelity with which VRC are now producing these things. And I've got to say, it's it's really welcome. It's a great addition to Aceto Corsa. It's ever-growing Formula One lineup. Hands down, this is probably the best beta yet that we have gotten from VRC. And I'm even saying that about the R25 as well that we got a couple of weeks ago because... That was phenomenal. This is even more phenomenal, and it makes me so very optimistic about the upcoming McLaren MP420. Yeah, just keep doing what you're doing, BRC. It's great. Absolutely great. However, for all of you who are still watching, I do thank you all very, very much for watching. Of course, there are hot laps to follow, so stay right where you are if you want to see this thing running around here at Falalunga without commentary from onboard as well as external views. However, I do just want to say one more thing. I know that this review is a little bit late. I acknowledge all of that. I am extremely busy at the moment, and it's really hard for me to find a spare couple of hours of uh, just of raw shooting time, and then that's not to mention the editing and all of that stuff, but I know this is late. I have really, really tried to get this out as soon as I can, and well, this is as soon as I can, so I apologize for being slightly behind the curve on this one. However, I do hope you did enjoy this one. It's a little bit shorter as well, I know, but I do hope that you did enjoy, and of course, do let me know what you think in the comments. However, until next time, Ferrari Man 601 saying, stay tuned for the hot laps at the end of this one, but until we meet again, so long everyone, and thank you all very, very much for watching. We will see you soon.